Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening and welcome to this uh, exceptional Voxer Up Live. Um, before we start, note that we have live interpretation available in French and in Italian. Check, you can check the globe marked interpretation on the right of your test taskbar, where you can select your preferred language interpreted by Marina for Italian and by Frédéric for French. Thanks a lot to both of you. We're thanking Sergei Lebedev and Katerina Mishenko very warmly for their participation tonight. They made an extraordinary effort for being with us, considering their personal situation and the context. Before introducing further our guests for tonight's conversation, we're also thanking Vox Europe members for their support. And many thanks also to our partners, Debates on Europe and Karl-Henri Fredriksson, who put us in touch with Sergei and Katerina in the first place. Thanks also to our partners, Traduki and S. Fisher Foundation for their support in publishing their articles, the articles from both authors. Yes, hello everybody and thank you to the audience also for your strong presence tonight. If you have questions for our guests, please take them in the chat box. We will filter and translate them and address them to our guests during the discussion, but also towards the end of the event. Uh, considering the extreme sensitivity of this current event and context, we might decide not to ask some questions, some of your questions to our guests. We will, of course, not allow any comment that could be seen as intentionally antagonistic or disrespectful or abusive towards any individual or community. And we would have to, and we have no other choice but to expel the authors of abusive comments from the discussion. We thank you for your understanding and we know that we can count on you, of course. Okay, so we can start. Um, so as you all know, on 24th February, Vladimir Putin launched an unprovoked attack on Ukraine after a long diplomatic standoff, a massive invasion that has killed over 1,200 civilians and an unknown number of soldiers for both sides. Over 2 million people already had to flee the country, seeking for shelter in neighboring, neighboring countries and all over Europe. This is not going to be a debate on the invasion. It would be a conversation with two prominent intellectuals who speak in their personal capacity. Sergei Lebedev, you worked as an investigative journalist from 2001 to 2014, and since 2010, you've written five novels dedicated to the theme of the Soviet hidden past, the impact of Stalin's repressions and its consequences on modern Russian life. Your books have been translated into 17 languages and the New York Review of Books has praised you as the best of Russia's younger generation of writers. Katarina Mishenko, you work as a writer, as a publisher and as a translator. You were the editor of uh, Frost Story, it's a magazine on art, literature and social critic. You're also the co-founder and editor of the Ukrainian publishing house Medusa and co-author of the book Ukrainian Night on the Euromaidan that was published in 2015 in German, English and Ukrainian. I will hand over directly to you, uh, Katarina, without asking mm -hmm. a question because that's what we decided. Uh, we have a short talk uh, with you and Sergei and uh, we let you uh, um, just ask the questions you have. And we would like to give you a room, a space for this tonight. Thank you. You mean now? Yes. Ah. <laughs> uh, then I should start with the question we discussed uh, previously. If this is okay for you? Yeah, it's okay for me. Uh, I don't know, maybe it will be a strange introduction in our talk, uh, but um, uh, I have uh, relatives in Russia and I read also Russian media who are still, uh, which are still capable to inform people about the events. Uh, I, so I mean, not the propaganda media, so I also reflect much on um, the Russian situation. And I also think a lot about people who came to Ukraine, 
who uh, uh, whose portrait uh, in our media, in Russian media, is quite different. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I read about young boys who didn't really know that uh, they are in the uh, con that they didn't uh, know that they signed the contract with the uh, Russian forces, and the, they didn't know that they are going to fight in Ukraine. And they are really young, they are scared, they are captured now by Ukrainian army, they are calling their parents. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, they, are, uh, they speak uh, in a way what is expected from them in the situation. But still, they don't seem uh, like uh, professionals who really understood what they are doing. On the other hand, there are already so many stories about uh, killing of peasants in villages, of bombings, uh, and it's not, uh, uh, it's not only the rockets which just come from the sky, it's also people who know that they are killing uh, civilians. So, um, I wanted to ask Sergei, maybe he can describe a bit this human landscape of the people who are in these army forces of Russia today, who came to Ukraine. I have a feeling that um, these are very different types of forces, also types of people or professionals. And uh, yeah. Can we somehow differentiate uh, them? And uh, is, uh, in general, is something like a collective portrait of uh, these Russian soldiers possible? I don't know. Let me be clear. I will not advocate anything. I will just try to be precise in my description. Uh, I think, and I think it as a former investigative journalist who was in touch, I would say, with the Russian army, that there are certainly different groups and different types of people within this invading force. First of all, we should understand that Russian army, let's call it army, in general, is the conscripts army still. It's the young boys of 18 years old who are conscripted. They are not intended to be contractors. They are not intended to be professional soldiers. They are the main bulk of the army. They are the main, let's say, group within the army. Second, we have those who are professionals, those who uh, make a contract to serve these are the second group. These are the people who earn money. And for a lot of Russians from the poorest regions, there is a, there is a way to earn their living or to build up their career. And of course, what is most important, we have uh, officers core. Those who are now colonels or generals or vice colonels, they started their careers, not now. They started their careers like 15 or 20 years ago when Russia was trying to occupy Chechnya. The officers' core of the army, and I do think that it's true, had the previous experience of their, I mean, we cannot. Uh, call it even war. It's the, it's in, in English. It's called punish to be the punisher. In in Russian, it's karatel. Mm -hmm. Those who are sent to subdue the population, not to fight with the regular army. So this is three different groups within, and I strongly believe that, for example, for the conscripts, who are not trusted even by their own command. It can be so that they were not informed beforehand that they will go 
and invade mm. to Ukraine. And uh, for, I can expect that these reactions, even though we can, we can say, I mean, they are more or less sincere. They were not informed. They were just thrown there because they are also not trusted. And it's all about the general mistrust within this system and because it's all built on fear and orders not on you know despite even russian propaganda pretends that it's the solidified will of the russian people to go and denazify ukraine which is i mean you know uh, we, we we would say that this um, 18 years or 19 years uh, youngsters they were not informed. The professionals or so-called professionals is the different group. It's their living, their money, they are, their education, however it could be. And the, the, but the most problematic part of this is, thing is the officers. Is the officers mm -hmm. with the very specific experience and with the very, I cannot call, call it morale, with the very specific mindset, I would say. And um, uh, I do remember that uh, Arkady Babchenko recognized uh, one of his, uh, let's say, regiment commanders when he became a general and he was one of the leading figures behind the Russian in, in invasion in Syria. I mean, this is more or less the same, the same people and they are stubborn. They are very very stubborn in their mindset, I would say. Um, so uh, this is this is this is the picture, and through these three three grades or three mm -hmm. stages of this picture, of course, all all people who are going into the army or conscripted into the army, they are exposed. To the, to the double propaganda effort. I mean, they are generally agitated by the Russian state TV or what, all this stuff. And of course, within the army system, you have also the special special infrastructure, how to, how to put this in the brains. One of my fellow journalists once spoke with the with the, let's say, elite of the Russian army, those from the guys from the special forces whom he encountered during the siege in Beslan. And he was mm -hmm. terrified by that, by the rubbish, what they were told in their, in Soviet times it was politi political enlightenment. Mm -hmm. They are told disaster of things like the Rothschild are still owning the world and we are we are in in the fight with the whole I, it's unbelievable again we are not advocating anything we are not advocating anything but but the picture but the picture is 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 like this and uh, the, we also should remember how it all was during the Chechen wars, because the, in the first days in 1994, the unarmed Chechen women were able to block the columns of the Russian mm -hmm. army. And actually the soldiers and the officers, they are very hesitant. I mean, they were not able to, to, to act ruthlessly immediately. But I would say that in a few weeks it changed. Mm. It changed. People's, uh, I mean, the, the Russian army started to, 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 to do the same, to shell the civilian apartments, to, I mean, it's all question of these weeks, especially mm. when you understand that you are sent there and there is no way out. Of course, during the Chechen wars, there were certain ways out. A lot of people were simply uh, um, trying to avoid recruitment or whatsoever. There is not the current situation in Russia. Uh, so uh, we can distinguish, I think, two things that, of course, there is a special, special units or whatsoever, those who are, from the very beginning, they are ready to, to shoot everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and we also can can say that those uh, young soldiers who were initiated initially 
not maybe even willing to go when the war is going on mm-hmm. they are and they are starting to to engage because they are both afraid of Ukrainian forces in front of them mm-hmm. and let's say the Russian Russian forces behind them uh, again I'm not advocating anything but it's it's clear that the the situation the, the war is changing the people's brains very very rapidly very rapidly and um, uh, uh, I do remember actually how, how it was in the in the 1995 and later during the Chechen campaigns mm-hmm. uh, it was just a few months from the this initial hesitation to the ethnic cleansings to the um, un- to the military crimes of the worst sort and it was the same army and the same people mm. and uh, it's clearly that uh, again Russia made an enormous effort just now also to to um, I'd say to to shelter the army from the from the from the outside because when Putin came to power in 1991, the first thing he said was that our independent media, namely the TV channels, were playing against the Russian army while informing about the military atrocities in Chechnya. Mm-hmm. And we should shut down them just because of this, because they're undermining the army morale. And now with this I mean, naked landscape without any possible, I mean, mass scale means of communication, we have what we have. Mm. May I ask a question? Um, I mean, what, what is maybe new in this, in this uh, invasion is the way to communicate. Uh, President Zelensky, he has a very direct way to communicate on social media. Uh, he has this frankly talking. He's not. He doesn't talk like a politician, and he he directly addresses to Russian short soldiers, telling them, "Get out of your tank. Um, this is not your uh, invasion. This is not your war." Um, he even proposed forty thousand euro, I think, to to each of them uh, if they just stop this. Do you think that this is and this can have an impact? This is a question to both of you. Or is this completely naive to think that that might convince some of them? Uh, I think it's... Um, I see it as, as a means of communication, just to show that uh, the position of uh, U- Ukrainian officials and maybe of Ukrainian society that we are still even in this situation peaceful and we want peace and we try to negotiate in different ways. Uh, if it really comes uh, to the people whom Zelensky addresses, I'm not sure because I don't know if they even have mobile phones with them because uh, some of the captured soldiers witnessed that they everything was taken and they came without any um, cell phones and they used the cell phones of Ukrainian soldiers to call their parents and to say we are captured in Ukraine. That's why I don't know uh, which, what kind of access to internet they have. But uh, it, it could be, of course, a, a mess, it is also a message to Russian author- authorities and yeah, kind of provocation maybe. I don't, so I think Zelensky, uh, he speaks Russian to, uh, in order to communicate with Russian side. He addresses many um, different actors, but actually he, uh, at the same time, he communicates with everyone, you know, and everyone can interpret uh, this message in, a, in yeah. some way. And I would say that it's, clear immense difference between all the Ukrainian officials and the Ukrainian society, which is 
willing to communicate and very open in their communication. And uh, Russian president being somewhere in his hiding and appearing only to make this uh, pre-stage speeches. Uh, I'm not sure how these messages can, can go, but the, the very fact that Ukraine is not shelling the Russian territory in retaliation is such a message who is for peace and who is not for peace that I mean there is no need for any further words this is amen amen um, and we also had one 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 um, <clears throat> one conversation with one one of my my let's say sources in in Russia and I would only to to confirm what Katerina said that mostly of course these uh, phones, these means of private messaging were taken very fast because initially it seems that the soldiers had them because initially, as we know, some other things were planned and maybe even uh, uh, the Russian state officials saw that these soldiers will be able to message like we are marching and we are welcome to his flowers whatsoever but in the very moment they realized that this plan is not valid anymore they took the effort to cut all the all the things because it's clear that one of the key things within russia is the army obedience is the army obedience to the orders from the supreme Command. Does it mean that um, they are completely cut off? I mean, I'm, any... I'm, I'm not a military expert. I yeah. can uh, I cannot say this, but we can expect that certain measures were were mm. were, were taken to, to get uh, back to your situation, uh, Katerina Nishenko. Uh, you 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 had to flee. You managed to flee. Um, Kiev, um, and you're, you're still in Ukraine, but in a safer uh, region. Um, how do you? What's the situation now? And and um, if I may ask, do you, what are the possible hopes? If there mm. are any. Yeah, yeah uh, I think uh, now it, it depends on the place where you are in Ukraine. And uh, this is the end, uh, your background of these uh, two weeks. Uh, we reflected with my husband also today that we are actually in a quite good situation because um, we are safe. No one is dead from our relatives or friends. Uh, yes, we don't uh, know if we can go back to Kiev and have our like things, apartment, our house is still okay and it's already something. We don't know if we will have this uh, kind of uh, structure which we had, which our son had, but um, yeah, it's uh, still not so terrible like uh, for other people. One friend of mine flee from Irpin. It's uh, not far from Kiev, and it is uh, this. Um, and uh, 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 Russian army wants to occupy Kiev. This is one of the main goals. That's why all the cities or all the small towns nearby, uh, there are many fights there, and it's mm -hmm. really dangerous. And it happened like really quickly. And she, uh, uh, yeah, for her, it was already a problem to leave. I don't remember when it was, I think like five days after us, so one week ago, maybe. Yeah, and it was uh, a very extreme experience. And now I see many destroyed houses in Irpin and um, 
Uh, and I know that there are still many people who should be evacuated and now it's really dangerous and Russian army uh, blocks the evacuation of people, blocks the transport where the evacuated people are. This, uh, so it's uh, like really war against civilians and uh, it's really difficult to negotiate and to follow some rules. That's why it's, uh, yeah, it's horrible. And uh, I think that many people who left, yeah, maybe they don't have their houses anymore, nothing, just uh, some bags. And uh, now maybe they go abroad and yeah, have to start uh, everything uh, from the very beginning. I don't know. I think um, it really depends. Uh, today um, yeah and uh, what i also think that me so that i am uh, maybe a, not a good witness of the situation because every day i have different moods different thoughts and i think that uh, all these events uh, yeah they are controlling me and sometimes I can reflect on them and uh, describe, so be like a medium to describe them. Uh, some days I just think about, yeah, nothing. There is nothing in my head. I read about new victims, new bombings, and uh, I don't feel anything. So it's a, a very strange process happening with people now in Ukraine. Uh, Katarina, you took part in the pro-European protests on Maidan Square, mm -hmm. uh, and you wrote a book about this time, which is called Ukrainian Night. We talked about that. Nearly 10 years later, given the current situation, is there any hope that Ukraine, Ukraine can integrate the European Union for you? Oh, I don't know. It's a funny question because uh, <laughs> or an ironical one because somehow you know okay i will start from a, uh, another point i think on the 26th of february sergey maybe you uh, also followed it mm -hmm. um it was um, on a russian official me in russian official media an article was published and afterwards it disappeared quickly yeah, yeah. about the uh, triumph of uh, uh, yeah of uh, ukraine uh, coming back to russian world and every the ukrainian question is finally solved to the, tri to the triple slavic world of russia belarus and yeah. ukraine like yeah yeah it was like uh, the manifesto of the winners in this uh, war and uh, as if uh, russia managed to occupy all the cities it wanted and now ukraine is part of russian world and uh, yeah, yeah everything is uh, good again and um, it was uh, interesting that uh, I think uh, on the homepage of RIA Novosti, the illustration of the article was Maidan Square. And Maidan and this title like Ukraine is, uh, I don't know, back in, in Russian. In the yeah, family it, of nations. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for me, it was really like... Um, yeah, like a gestalt for Russian uh, authorities, for Kreml, because Maidan was uh, kind of um, trigger all this time. That's why it's so important to go back, to come back there after all these years, after all these uh, uh, escalations and to finish, really to solve this Maidan question finally. And uh, that's why I found uh, it also interesting that we have like um, today the radical tension of two uh, utopias, I would say so. This Ukrainian utopia like Ukraine um, as a member of European Union and uh, we uh, 
made our yeah, like application yeah and we are waiting for the answer and on the other hand we have this war which can uh, just destroy everything and uh, in order to create some own utopian uh, vision i don't know what uh, yeah what they want now because uh, this uh, triumph of solving ukrainian question didn't happen and now I see only destroying of everything, but still, okay, this dystopic idea maybe still maybe is somewhere there. And we are just in between these two, yeah, completely different options. And uh, yeah, it's um, but uh, you know, um, Somehow I feel very sorry for European Union now as an institution, because I read uh, in news that not all countries want uh, Ukraine to be the part of the EU. There are some bureaucratic things. There are some reforms which should be uh, implemented. This, um, yeah, because, yeah, in this situation, we are speaking about some affirmative decision, about some strong support, about some radical step in a very radicalized and horrible situation. And uh, in this situation, to speak about bureaucracy, reforms, is just like, you know, like everything is okay and we just uh, have to uh, repair Ukraine a little bit and now it's fine. And uh, for me, it's as a... So politically, it's absolutely irrelevant and weak. And uh, that's why I can think about European integration uh, in this anthropological sense, just to interpret all the processes and uh, roles of them in the Ukrainian history. But uh, pragmatically, uh, I don't... so. I don't know. I have a feeling that even now, European Union doesn't want really. I don't know. Doesn't see us as a. Uh, how to say? Doesn't accept us. Maybe it's a good uh, question. Uh, it's a good description. It's, it's still. Uh, keeps uh, some distance, even in this situation. This is my feeling. And that's why I don't know. Of course, it, it would be good for Ukraine, but uh, I'm asking myself now, uh, what, uh, yeah, what will happen to Ukraine in general? On first days, I uh, told my husband, yeah, uh, now EU is ready to integrate us, but maybe it will be some something like a ghost of Ukraine. We don't know if we will exist. That's why it's, uh, yeah, it's a question, yeah, which is which, which uh, will be answered someday, but not today. Yeah, thanks a lot. In terms of uh, the response from the. Uh, EU in terms of economic sanctions, for example, and Zelensky said, you know, in a way that I think this this efforts are still not enough. I mean, it's it's uh, basically uh, Ukraine still feels abandoned, and I know it's a very general question again, but um, uh, yeah, how do you how do you see this response? And and we ha we have yours on this. Mm -hmm possible membership and yeah i have a feeling that uh, slowly different countries uh, all of them have a different speed i would say mm. some of them are really slow but they are understanding that this politics of um, how to say uh, of peaceful negotiating with Russia, it just doesn't work. It's not uh, a question of loving Russia or hating Russia. It just doesn't work. And uh, one should take steps which bring some results. And I think this is also position of Zelensky. It's not about punishing somebody just, uh, just to punish. It's 
it's about to stop this war and to stop these uh, actions from Russian side. And of course, it's not enough because people are dying. I don't know. I think uh, from ethical point, it's quite clear. And uh, yeah, and I'm really surprised and disappointed that even in these situations, some countries like Germany, for example, still thinks about its economical, economic interests. And it's so obvious, I would say even a bit obscene to demonstrate it in a way. Sergey, uh, would you like to uh, add something? <clears throat> you know, for years, speaking with the European journalists, I was advocating one thing, the problem with Mr. Putin is not that he's corrupt, which was, let's say, the obvious point of view. The problem is that he's a criminal of other sort. And okay, people were listening to this, and yeah, it was very useful to have the, him, his shape as a enlightened autocrat with the repressive methods, yes, with a certain um, unbearable uh, approaches, but in general, yes. And of course, now all this approach just collapsed, just collapsed. And uh, as Catherine said, the reaction is very slow, very slow to, to realize what is going on, what is at stake, what is going on. Um, and I see that a lot of media are still uh, trying to um, trying to, to act like it's, uh, you know, it happens somewhere. There is two nations involved. We should speak with both sides. We should ask this fucking Russian authors, what, what is, I mean, what is like, maybe we were, um, I just received the request today. Maybe we were wrong regarding the Russian soul. I mean, it's, <laughs> Even the media are not not grasping what is going on. Even the media are not grasping what is going on. What matters is a clear, practical things, not this generalized talks and so on. And of course, I mean, we can can also say that it's it's a, it's also a sort of a show. I mean, this banning of the Russian oligarchs or whatever, it should be done. But I mean, it's. It's, it's, it's irrelevant now. Some other things should be done in the first place. Okay, you will deal with these oligarchs. They are, they are already in Russia. They will not go from it. But so, it's so, in, so imbalanced, so unstructured. And it's clear that there is no... I mean, I, I, I can imagine that Poland understand this. Poland understand this. But I, I don't feel that there is a general clear, uh, uh, coordinated response. It's all about this very uh, difficult way of negotiating. And of course, the Russian side knows this. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they know this very well. And I, I do, do believe that the, the guy who is in charge for 20 years, who have seen like generations of these presidents or um, coming, coming and go, he knows all the weaknesses of the, of the European system. And of course, the very plan of the invasion was based on this presumption that it will be so swift mm -hmm. that, I mean, in a few days, Europe just will awake and see the other world, but only due to the Ukrainian resistance. It doesn't work. Katerina, did you mm -hmm. want to add something about maybe, um, what could be maybe the greatest help at the moment? I know it's, again, it's general, but um, uh, Navalny from his uh, detention camp, he said, uh, I think it was today, yesterday, he said that um, uh, there is a growing uh, resistance in, in, in Russia, for example, from uh, 
people are demonstrating and 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 um, that that could be maybe uh, increasing. Um, do you think that it could be of, of any of any uh, giving? I mean, any kind of support to the. Uh, I. Um, uh... I am not sure that uh, uh, in the current situation uh, it is really possible to change Russia from bottom mm. uh, because um, yeah the civic society is destroyed uh, media uh, like uh, professional media cannot work there and the yeah the repressive apparatus is uh, quite effective that's why i don't know i think that maybe someday but not in today's uh, situation um, with ukraine here uh, we need uh, in our situation we need the pressure from uh, other countries and uh, of course uh, uh, we need a consolidation and uh, all the support uh, Ukraine is asking for. Because, uh, you know, uh, I had uh, also before the war during this escalate, like diplomatic escalation, I was also asked also in German media, what should we do, etc. And my answer was do the things uh, which could prevent this uh, everything and i i cannot say uh, specifically what we have uh, professionals like our uh, minister for foreign affairs who has some clear points and uh, communicates them all the time but what i want to uh, say uh, i don't know uh, what kind of audience you have but i pro uh, think people of culture of intellectual work and um, I think for such uh, uh, kind of people in Europe is sometimes difficult uh, to accept the militant uh, position of Ukraine, so to say. If when, uh, when we speak with our colleagues from uh, um, Western European countries and we say we all should uh, 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 should demand from our governments uh, or you Western friends should demand from your governments to support the uh, milit uh, for military demand the military support of Ukraine. Not only this humanitarian kind of support, like uh, uh, I don't know, hosting refugees, hosting cultural workers, artists, organizing exhibitions, and uh, you know, act through this soft power. Okay, it's uh, always fine. And I think for Ukrainian uh, society, it's really important to be seen, to be uh, finally, yeah, interesting for other countries. Of course, it's important. But this humanitarian thing, it's good for the further Ukrainian cultural integration. And now to survive, Ukraine needs military support. It, it's not because we are like crazy militants and violent people. It's because it's the way to save us. And uh, this is, uh, I think, something what, what is difficult for people in Western, especially in Western Europe, because the last war you had was like 18 years ago. And uh, I know European people, they are really uh, non-violent, so reflective, so soft uh, in schools, in all the social systems. And we have completely other experience in our life. And now, especially like a wild and crazy experience and really brutal. And uh, we know very good that if such kind of aggression happens, the only way to stop it is to be also aggressive. There is no other way in the in today's situation, and I think it's something what should be understood and should be accepted. Unfortunately, 
Let me ask a question uh, from the from the audience, uh, Javier. He asked, "Do you think Ukraine should have nuclear weapons immediately as a way to force and stop to the war and to force a negotiation?" This is a question for both of you. Oh, I think it's not possible, and I also think that nuclear weapons is now a big uh, topic. Uh, I know it in Germany, for example, yeah, and even. Uh, uh, even here in Western Ukraine, some people are buying this yacht and preparing for something. But it is kind of, um, for me, it's something like a distraction from the very uh, current situation in Ukraine. And first, we, uh, yeah, we just should stop these bombings and these killings of civilians and this uh, war which is happening now. And these discussions on nuclear weapons is something, yeah, like some uh, a bit abstract discussion which just uh, yeah distracts people from what uh, what is happening in Ukraine, and um, it is also a tool I think of uh, uh, Kreml to create this aura of. Uh, of uh, horrible and uh, great uh, demonic figure of Putin and everyone, uh, everybody should be afraid of him and he's so irrational and so terrible and we, uh, yeah, we should save ourselves and Ukraine, yeah. It would be good if it is only Ukraine who will uh, somehow um yeah who will be the victim in this situation i think that uh, it is uh, a very problematic construction of uh, perception of uh, what is happening now and uh, yeah and for ukraine now it's also not really possible i think to have these nuclear weapons and uh, i i i should say for ukrainian context now also for for our media landscape, it's not uh, a question. It, it's, it is not something which is discussed. Uh, what is discussed, I, I think you know it, it's uh, this idea of closing the sky. But now if we, when we see that NATO uh, doesn't want uh, to intervene in this uh, um, uh, war, uh, we, are, we, I mean Ukraine just, um, asks for uh, planes for different technical support to protect the sky by uh, themselves by ourselves so this is uh, the question now which is uh, like uh, mentioned many times a day when our president or other officials speak to international partners Thank you. There's a, another question from the, the public, uh, Maria But Laura. Let, let me comment on, okay, the, yeah, sure. on, the previous, uh, on the previous issue regarding Navalny and um, the possibility. The problem is, and I think Katrina knows this, that for many years before, even the most radical Russian oppositioners were silent about what had happened in 2014, 2015. The main agenda of the opposition was again, the corruption of the state mm -hmm. authorities. I was repeating this everywhere where it was possible, that the problem is not this corruption. The, 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 the whole hierarchy of the crimes are overthrown. The problem is this that we are occupying country, we are occupying force. Let this fucking corruption go. Let's speak about the main things, the general things, the general crimes. It never happened. So now when Alexei, I mean, he's personally brave, this, this goes to him. But when he now tries to change his own agenda and start to, to talk with the people, I mean, it's a bit too little too late. It's a bit too little too late. This was the main question of the responsibility 
this was the general question to talk about. But I think that even the oppositioners, they felt that they will not be welcomed by the general population with this agenda. It's easy to speak about the corruption because everybody feels okay, our money are stolen and so on. And it is so difficult to speak about this moral crimes. Only Andriy Sakharov was able to stand and say what we are doing in Afghanistan. Let's withdraw our troops. And we all do remember what had happened later. He was just applause to death. So um, this, is, this, is, this is the one thing. And the second, again, I absolutely agree. In 2014, when, when Russia next Crimea first, I was in Germany and I spoke with German uh, journalists. And I was trying to say that it, it demands immediate action, immediate reaction. But they were telling, but I mean, it's maybe it will go somehow on its own way. It, we need some time to react. I mean, I mean, it's it's all gone. It's all gone for now. It's all gone for now. And it's clear that these strategies, these strategies were used for so many years that the actors, the decision makers are used to them. It's very, very good for, for yourself to, to be in this mood. Yes, but we will, we will act somehow or somewhere. Oh, okay. Um, take some some more questions from the audience. There's a question from Matteo. Let's imagine for a second that Putin will fall. However, this might happen. Let's imagine even just as a hypothetical scenario. Do you think Russia would be would be better off, or are there existing forces, political, economic, international, that may even make the situation worse? Um. I mean, let me answer in a mm -hmm. very simple way that we can consider that the sanctions or whatsoever will cripple the regime. But then it will fall just due to the economic reasons. And it's absolutely different moral situation. We cannot predict what will happen after. But it's clear that it will not fall because of the anti-war protest. And this is two different collapses, as the Soviet Union itself collapsed, not because people demanded freedom so much. I mean, within the core of the Soviet Union, within the, within the Russian Federation, but because of the economical um, reasons because of the economical burden and the ideological uh, ideological troubles and we see that this type of collapse if it's not reflected if it's uh, like given from the heaven it cannot cut the delivery of this poisonous heritage and what wasn't done in 1991 namely punishing the Soviet crimes, it, 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 gives, it gives the second birth to this empire. Now, would, would you want to comment on this as well? On Putin's fall? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a beautiful fantasy, but uh, uh, I don't have a feeling that we will um, uh, see it uh, next time somehow I um, because uh, yeah it could be a solution just to you know just to cancel one person and everything will be good but I think that uh, um, yeah uh, we should uh, we all should act uh, very active uh, actively to stop this war and then we will see what he will happen next, but not to wait for his, 
I don't know, death or disappearance or some other things. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question from a journalist, uh, Olivier, uh, who works for Le, Le Monde and, and Alternative Economique. Hello, I've worked in Ukraine in the past, uh, in 2004 and 2005 in, in, uh, uh, in Russian. And I've been following events since then, independently from the crazy criminal, as Sergei very correct, correctly says, uh, and I would add mafia and imperialist-like politics of Vladimir Putin, that would have to be in future where in the future where Ukraine is still including uh, Russophones, the politics of language, and I'm not referring to the religious divide too. It seems to me that the situation of Ukraine speaks to other bilingual or multilingual countries such as Belgium, Spain, etc. Mm -hmm. Is it a question? Yeah, it is. It is a question uh, whether the question was long, but um, yeah. But Ukraine is bilingual and multi-religious country, and uh, yeah, hmm. it, it, it is now. I I don't know. Uh, you know now it's a question if you uh, yeah what uh, what will be Ukraine like uh, I mean physically yeah not conceptually but conceptually now it's uh, uh, yeah it's a very diverse country and our current president is a person who uh, who supports it and. Uh, yeah, who support it, uh, supports it in uh, different ways, and um, he is uh, a Russian speaker by himself. But you know this uh, uh, general topic of question uh, of language. Uh, yeah, I know it. Uh, it has a, an own history, but somehow Ukraine is uh, so often criticized for supporting Ukrainian language in Ukraine. And I think it's, um, it's a strange uh, position. At the same time, it's a long topic and uh, maybe to, uh, yeah, to put it short, we yeah. are now such a kind of country and hope, hopefully we will stay open and uh, yeah and multicultural. I mean, uh, the, the, the language issue was one of the let's say, main topics for the Russian uh, propaganda or for the Russian justification of all sorts of actions against Ukraine. That the Russian language is suppressed or whatsoever. But if you will look within the Russian Federation itself, you will see that it consists of dozens of different nations and their languages are suppressed far more than any legislation uh, which were introduced in Ukraine in support of Ukrainian language. This is the reality within the empire, but nobody speaks about this within the Russia itself because this is the reality. This is the linguistic reality for the for, for, for the so-called subjects of the Russian Federation, and this language issue should be treated very carefully because it's so many things, and so many times it was used to explain that we, we the Russia, are going to protect our native speakers. That I mean, when you are in Ukraine you clearly hear just the polyphony. Just the polyphony. I was working in Kyiv in the last years for many times. It's just a polyphony. And I mean, there was no troubles or no things like, okay, I'm, I'm, I am the male from the country which holds the aggressive stand against Ukraine. I was able to travel there. I was able to work in the archives. 
I was welcomed. This is the reality of how, how the Russian language was treated. And again, we shouldn't forget that the Russian language, especially in the 20th century, was clearly and consciously used as a tool of subject. We shouldn't forget this. And maybe for the, you know, for the peaceful countries where these questions are settled centuries ago, the, some decisions could be seen as a radical. But if you will look from within, you wouldn't say so, because it was clearly that the, uh, uh, let me just tell you one short story. Uh, when the war broke out in 2014, it had very different repercussions. And one of them happened in Karelia, in the northern region of Russia, where we have the memorial complex, the shooting polygon from the 1937, which is called Sandermoch. Around 1,000 Ukrainians are buried there. It's the Ukrainian cultural elite. This was the clear operation. This was the clear thing to, to, to eliminate those who were, the, to, who were the, the bulk or the head of the Ukrainian culture. And many, many years ago, a Ukrainian delegation in 2014 was prohibited from there to come and to, to, to commemorate their, um, their countrymen who, who are still there. This is the reality. This is the reality which is not seen from, from our world. This is the reality for, for, for let's say, for, 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 uh, for, for, for Ukrainian independence fighters, for example, who are absolutely clearly treated by, by Moscow and by Russia as the sort of um, collaborators with the Nazis. Just, just don't go deeply into this very complicated thing. But of course, the language is the key. The language is the key and Ukrainian language in the Ukrainian country. Yeah. What, what else can you expect? And, uh, but I would also say, it's not the question for now. Hmm. Don't go further in these discussions now. It was all relevant before. No language issues or whatsoever can in any way justify what had happened. Hmm. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I'll ask another question. Um, from the public and Marie and Marie Couture, sharing here the Facebook post from Maciek Spartowski, a Polish colleague and scholar in civilian resistance. Kiev today is like Warsaw in 1944, whose uprising resulted in 200,000 dead and complete destruction of the city. Krakow in, one, in 1944 served, saved itself from that fate by strategically choosing not to take up arms against too much more power, powerful Nazi army. Choosing an armed civilian resistance would save many lives. How about evacuate Zelensky, government resistance, resistance and all civilians who want to leave and then focus on unrelenting and total non-cooperation of Kiev residents with occupiers. The power of civilian base and unarmed resistance has proven to be formidable in other historical contexts. What does Katerina think of this? And of course you as well, uh, Sagi, if you want to answer. Mm. Yeah. Well, mm. <laughs> I don't know what I think of this. I think that um, mm, we uh, have already seen that this war, yeah, reminds of Syria more than maybe uh, uh, the Second World War. The strategy of extermination in the situation where uh, the mm, this special operation, special military operation was not uh, possible, just uh, extermination started with these bombings of, uh, I don't know, hospitals, kindergartens, schools, uh, in masses, 
it's not uh, about accident uh, accidental rockets it's just uh, a strategy of today that's why i don't know what kind of civilian resistance is really possible i know this uh, um, examples of other cities uh, in ukraine uh, which are already occupied like kherson in the um, uh, southern part of Ukraine, Kherson, Berdyansk, uh, my goodness, uh, I don't know wh where it happened uh, these last days. So, okay, these cities, uh, uh, there were uh, big uh, pro-Ukrainian demonstrations there and uh, some tensions with Ukrainian army uh, who which is present there in the city and uh, yeah it works like uh, so for example in Kherson they just moved to the city border they are not in the center of the city but they block electricity water supplies any humanitarian uh, aid and they block the people they cannot leave the city and what can you do you know, you go to the street with the Ukrainian flag and say, guys, go away. You don't have to save us from any kind of nationalist. We speak Russian here and we don't know to be saved by, we don't want to be saved by Putin. And what? Okay, they go and uh, block everything and just wait till people start, uh, I don't know, starving. And uh, yeah, and this is. Uh, uh, and what kind of um, pragmatic is this? Just, uh, yeah, I don't know, demoralization of the society just to, yeah, destroy people. And, uh, yeah, that's why I think that only uh, what uh, rescued Ukraine uh, in these two weeks, it was the military resistance and uh, this our okay, not perfect, but still working system of um, how to say it, air, um, air defense. Air defense. This is uh, these things rescued uh, people and uh, yeah, Kiev uh, also from occupation, not uh, somehow peaceful demonstrations of people because, um, yeah. But uh, I really uh, admire our people who are going to the street uh, under the occupation when uh, the soldiers are in the city and they still go, yeah, and try to stop the tanks. It's uh, really crazy, but it happens and doesn't bring much. Sergey, do you want to add something? The time is ticking also within the Russia, because what they initially tried to sell this, let's see, short special operation. And now they are in desperate need to explain what actually is going on. And they they are not able to just just hold just just withdraw. It seems that they need sort of you know some cities to present that they are taken or whatsoever. Because I'm trying to to to, to follow what the Russian official media is reporting, and still there is no signs that propaganda is hesitating. There is no clear signs of that. Uh, So it seems that they they need to present because initially it was proclaimed this is a denazification of of Ukraine and they need to to bring at least some 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 results of this denazification some cities taken or, or whatsoever I don't know I don't I really don't understand where are the lines now because it's clearly that they they gone every every human line are broken now i mean they are they are in the 
in the 20th century in, in, in its worst times. I'm not sure we have much more time to ask questions we, since we still have uh, five minutes only. Um, I'm, I'm sorry well, we can't ask all the questions, but I would like to again give uh, the floor to both of you. Um, if it's okay with you just to, um, we can't conclude on this. This is, as you said, Sergei is changing all the time. The situation is evolving very, very fast all the time. But uh, Katerina, would you like to um, not conclude, but say something that you really want us to to hear tonight? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I agree with Sergei. Sergei, the time is ticking, and Oop. I think the maybe the connection is not so good. Would you like to use this time? Okay. I think I would like to address to the journalists who I think who are present now here, my dear colleagues. Uh, I had a lot of conversations these days, and uh, I do feel that people are not still in a in 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 a mode. People are still talking about the uh, danger of activism in the newspapers or whatsoever. Okay, but please give the every bit of the paper of the every minute of the air in the TV or the radio to the Ukrainian voices, to the Ukrainians, to the Ukrainians. They deserve it. They need it just now because the time is ticking very fast. And actually, it's, it's not the correct moment for this long intellectual discussions or, I mean, the time is ticking, the time is ticking. Please do whatever possible. I mean, you know what to do. Thank you very much. I don't know whether we've lost uh, Katerina. I have the feeling that she's gone. Oh, I see. So we, 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 she's trying to reconnect. So maybe if you, it's okay, we wait we a wait. little. We wait a little, definitely. Yeah, so to make sure that she can uh, say what she'd like to say uh, towards the end of the, this live. I hope she'll be able to reconnect. Let's just wait. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's necessary. Yeah, sure. But let's just wait together. Mm -hmm. I can, I can hear and understand what, what you just said, uh, Sergei. And we see tonight so many questions. We can't um, ask them all. It goes so many directions, of course. But just having you both tonight and, and having this conversation between you two, this is maybe one of the small things journalists can do in this situation. There's not much we can do. We try on Box Europe to, to publish articles from the independent Ukraine media and the independent Ukraine and uh, Russian media too. Uh, of course, this is a little step, but yeah, this feeling of, of not being able to, to, to interact or to, to, to have an answer to all this is, is very, it's, it's horrible for all, of, for all of us, of course. Katarina, I think she's back. I'm back, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but I cannot uh, uh, make me visible. 
I don't know what to add. I think that uh, I said that uh, Sergey is right, time is ticking, and we should be somehow synchronized in the perception of what is happening. Uh, this is maybe uh, the most important message for today. And uh, in general, I want to thank you. I saw that uh, the audience was really, uh, yeah diverse people from different countries and it's nice to have you all thank you very very much to both of you um for your presence and all the things you you told us tonight um thank you thank you everybody for um listening to us and and being there, I'm very sorry we couldn't ask all the questions. There were many, many questions and probably not enough time, but I think our, both uh, Sergei uh, and uh, Katerina answered many questions and said a lot. So um, thank you for everybody and, uh, every, and uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah, and thank you, Katerina, for speaking with me and God, God bless you and God bless Ukraine. Yeah, thank you, Sergei, thank you. Thank you very much.